I take great pleasure in announcing tonight's speaker, Dr. Tess Mackling, and Tess is an expert in all things to do with torques. And the title this evening is Talking Torques, South to North or North to South. And we're also lucky enough to have her co-worker, Roland Williamson, who is a renowned replica maker, and he's joining us today as well. So I'll hand over to you then, um, Tess. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello, everyone. And, and yeah, amazing to have people from all over the place. Uh, hopefully I can just, we can have a nice, relaxing talk for seven o'clock at night and look at some lovely gold as well. Now, is this going to? Yes, right. So I'm kind of, I know a lot of people will have seen us talk before, but if you haven't and I jump straight in, assuming you know what we've done before, that's going to be really tough. So I'm just going to have a brief recap of stuff that a lot of people may well know, but just in case people don't. And then I've got loads of new things later on. So basically, gold in Iron Age Britain kind of stops at the end of the late Bronze Age and it apparently vanishes and then appears again about 300 BC. Um, and what you've got, apart from gold coins, the number of gold items, what they're actually made into is very, very restricted. So you've got things like talks here, like the grotesque talk or the leak frith talks. You've got, these are also talks, but they're more arm ring sized. So they kind of fit at the upper arm. You've got kind of, this is an arm ring as well, but there's only one really like that. A few finger rings, there's literally only about 10 or 15 of these in the whole country, and they're very, very simple. They all look like this, or they're a single wire made into various shapes. Or you've got little, this again is a talk, but a little buffer talk. But apart from that, we don't really have brooches, we don't have sword things. You have little bits of gold that appear on things, but the artifacts themselves are talks, bracelets and rings and coins, and that's about it. And the majority of them are gold talks. Um, now, this is the site of Snettisham, Snettisham, Snettisham from East Anglia, which I'll get onto a bit later. But yes, mainly what we've got are these talks. So just in case people don't know, what is a talk? So here you've got the dying ghoul sculpture wearing it around his neck. Obviously, Boudicca is described as wearing this gold neck ring, but we don't really know whether that was a talk or not. Did Boudicca exist? Did the talk exist? Who knows? You've also got things like the Gundestrup Cauldron from Denmark, where you can see here Carinus holding a talk in his hand, and he's actually wearing one as well. Then towards the end of the period, towards the Roman time, you suddenly start getting a lot more of these talks being held rather than worn. So it's not necessarily that they were all worn. And then we have things like this. Now this only happened a couple of years ago that someone picked them up and played with them and realized they did this. And these are talks from Iberia, very, very typical, the kind of shape of the terminal at the end. And when you look inside, through an x-ray, you can actually see that these Iberian talks have an intentionally added little pellet. So they were designed to do that. It's not accidental. But we don't think we've got that in this country. Definitely the ones we've seen x-rays of don't have pellets in. There's also a possibility that talks were put on statues. Um, the Romans described them being on statues. So they're kind of, they're not necessarily just the one thing. And talks also come in so many different forms and types. I mean, the top here, the Newark talk, which you can see here at the top, is the one that the kind of design that most people think they are. But you have all kinds. You have tubular talks like this, which are incredibly thin gold, all kinds of terminals. So buffer terminals like train terminals, ring terminals that are overcast, cast hollow terminals, these things, cage talks flat-ended ones, ribbon talks, 
grotesque talk up in the top right, which is more plastic style. So they really are a huge range and they don't just come in gold either. They come in silver, they come in bronze. There's one in lead, a couple in iron as well. Um, and they can also be gilded, gilded bronze. So an incredibly wide variety of types. Now, the problem that we do have, you can see on the left here, these are the British and Irish excavated torques. On the right is the antiquarian metal detected accidental finds or unpublished ones. Now, these ones on the left, the Stettisham Hordes G, H, J, K, L, Blair Drummond and Hengisbury Head. However, on the right, and this isn't all of them, I couldn't actually fit the pictures in. Stettisham Hordes A, B, C, D, E and F, Alras, Borsey, Clevedon, Essendon, Glasgow, Ipswich, Kingsland, Leakfrith, Southwest, Norfolk, Middleton Hall, North Creek, Netherer, Needham Forest, Newark, Sedgeford, da 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 you get the idea. Now, Snettisham, the Snettisham Hordes A, B, C, D, E and F also include the Great Talk and a vast number of scraps and pieces of talks. And the problem is that even the archaeologically excavated ones, Snettisham hasn't even yet been published. So basically, often all we have is the talks themselves to go on. We have very little archaeological context information, sadly. Now, how we got into this, as has been mentioned, Roland's a replica maker. And back in 2005, I think you made a copy of the Southwest Norfolk talk. So, but he was bothered about how they were made because basically the kind of the law regarding these, this is where I get my chocolate talk. Here we go. I should hold it up there. This is a copy of the Nether Road Terminal. So what the theory was is that these were made cast using melt, molten metal. And what you do is you get the clay rough shape. You then cover it with wax, carve your design into the wax, cover it with a thin layer of clay and then thicker layers of clay, heat it up, pour the wax out. So you effectively have a hollow that will take the form of the gold pour your gold in, but you only pour your gold in once you've got it attached to these wires. So here you can see at the bottom here, the Snettisham Great Talk, and you've got 64 handmade wires there. And you have one go at casting this terminal onto these wires. You get it wrong, all of your molten metal will either melt these wires, you'll have to try and extract it off the wires using losing the length that you've put on, now, as a replica maker, Roll was bothered by this because it, it's just crazy. You would make this separately, then you would attach it to the wires. Then if this goes wrong, you can do it again, but you haven't damaged your neck ring. And of course, the obvious thing is you've got two terminals. You have one each side of your neck here. If you were casting this on, you've got to get it right on one end, and then you've got to get it right on the other end. And the chances of that happening is quite slim. So this is where we came from. That he had this hunch that it's really, from all his years of experience of making replicas, this just didn't seem like a very, it didn't seem really sensible to him. Myself, kind of more from the academic archaeological side, I wanted to know why this had been said. So as I say, the established view is that these hollow cast terminals, cast in relief, cast onto the wires, et cetera, et cetera. When I went looking for the evidence of this, you do a literature search, you go and try and find where the evidence is. We couldn't actually find that evidence. We could find a lot of people saying it, but not any reasons why they were saying it. So this is what started us off. It's literally the result of a couple of emails, <laughs> but then sent us off into this mad thing about eight years ago now. So what we needed to be able to work out how they were made is a talk that wasn't attached, a terminal that wasn't attached to anything. Because obviously the great talk like this one, you've got the wires down here and you can't see inside to see what's going on in here. Um, and as any of you who know who follow me on Twitter will know, I'm always talking about show us your backside, show us your insides. 
because that's where all the evidence is for making. So Roll got onto Google, Googled talk, <laughs> and found the Netherer Terminal, which is actually on display in the National Museum of Scotland if you want to go and see it. Now, the beautiful thing about Netherer, apart from the fact that it is absolutely stunning, it's one of those finds that it got forgotten somewhere, and I don't know how, really. But the wonderful thing about it is that you can see inside because it was taken off the neck ring that it used to be attached to before it was buried in the ground. It was just buried on its own. It was also buried with three other torques and 40 coins. Um, but as so often happened in the 19th century, the rest of the hoard went to an Edinburgh goldsmith and was never seen again. So all we have now is the torque terminal and two of the remaining coins. But when we looked inside, what you would expect to see if this was a cast terminal, you know, bearing in mind at that time, we were thinking these were cast separately and then put onto the wires. So what we thought we'd see is inside this talk, you'd see it was flat because where the metal runs in, it's obviously got a flat surface on the underside and then it just kind of like a jelly mold fills, fills the gaps. But what we did see when we looked inside is you've actually got all of these indentations. You've also got seams running around here on the right hand side on the interior where you can see that sheets have actually been overlapped, sheets of gold. And we very soon realized that what we were looking at was not a cast talk. This was actually made from sheet gold. And then from various other things, I mean, we then started looking closer and you can see on the left hand picture, there's slight gaps between where the sheets have been attached. And from this, we could put together the fact that actually these talks are made from three different sheets. You've got a torus shell, which would have been open. And then this kind of apple core shaped core of gold inserted into the center and then smoothed over. Once that was done, the collar was added. Once the collar was done, it was then attached to the wires. So no casting on, not even cast separately, but actually made of sheet gold. And this is all from this wonderful little talk from Peebleship. So once we found out that, we started looking at other talks because the, the Netherer terminal, this one, is exactly the same size as the Snettersham Great Talk Terminal. So we thought, hmm, now if Netherite sheet, maybe this one as well. We also looked at the Grotesque Talk from Snettersham. Turns out, of course, both of them are sheet. And when we looked at, there's an X-ray on the side of the case in the British Museum in room 50. And when we looked at that, what we could see from the X-ray is that it's made in exactly the same way as the Great Talk, and as the nether terminal. And you can see here on the x-ray, these areas of white <clears throat> are actually slightly thicker gold. It's slightly more obvious on this one. So where the sheets have overlapped, you've actually got a slight lip there, and you've also got this thickening where the two sheets are on top of each other, so you've got a thicker layer. So we then got three torques that were made of sheet. We also were looking at the Newark talk, which actually turned out it wasn't made of sheet. It's a cast sheet hybrid where they've, on this one, the shell has actually been cast and then they put in a um, hammered core. And we think they were doing that to overcome these problems with trying to cast an entire thing, which I'll show you a bit later. It, it always goes wrong. When we looked at Newark and Netherard, there's these little tiny, you see here on the great talk, this is called basket work or matting or tooling. Now, both Netherard and Newark are covered in this. And when we looked, everyone just talked about it as matting or tooling. No one ever looked at it in detail. Now, these little marks are only less than a millimetre across. And when we started looking at them closely, on Newark and Netherard, although they looked completely random and odd, when we actually started kind of taking them apart, we were seeing the same shapes, the same little motifs again, again and again in amongst this kind of random order. So you'd have these two strokes down, two strokes across, which you can see left 
Netherard, right in Newark here, we've had this two and three pattern and these little kind of like jumpy men, little body and little arms doing star jumps. And then variations on that theme, so three at the bottom, two at the top. And we were seeing them both on Netherard and Newark, different motifs time and time again. And if you compare that to the Great Talk and the Sedgwick Talk, bottom right, you can see it's totally different. This is a very, very regular pattern. We also looked at the roundels, which are these little, I'm not sure I can show, yeah, I can. There, you see they're only, I mean, this is one-to-one -one exact size. So they're only about 10 mil across, if that. And we were seeing the same thing again. So at the top here, we've got Newark A to D, and at the bottom is Netherard. And this same pattern, three little strokes in from the left, and then two down, two across on the right. And we could see that time and time again on both these talks. And if you look on the top right here, you can see I've put the black dots and the stars in to make it easier to see where they are. We also have had various other things that the tooling on Newark and Netherard on the roundel, it goes anti-clockwise on both Netherard and Newark. You've got the larger, these are called dummy rivets at the bottom and then a smaller one above. And as you can see, that trends the whole way through. They were actually using 17 strokes on the Newark roundels and 19 on the Netherard roundels. But as you can see from Sedgwick roundel in the bottom, now that one is actually tooled clockwise. The dummy rivets are almost the same size. It's far more precise. There's far more strokes. What we've got here are two talks that were either made or finished by the same person, one from Nottinghamshire, one from Peoplesshire. And then when we started looking a bit further afield here, I put the nether terminals onto wires as it would once have been. And we know it was because where the terminal, the hole at the end of the terminal, there's little indentations of wire. So it was certainly once a talk. But when we look at how far apart those two talks are, how different they look, and yet that little tooling showed us that the same person was involved in their making. We then found one in Snettersham, which has the little jumpy men and various other things. Again, those same motifs cropping up time and time again. So now we've got three talks over a space of 300 miles, all made by or finished by the same person. This hasn't been seen before. This is what started making us think that actually maybe not all roads lead to East Anglia, because we've actually now got two talks further away from East Anglia than we have from the one that's in East Anglia. Going to the casting on. So yeah, there were some cast on talks, but as you can see from these, they are horrible and they go wrong the whole time. So we've got holes. There's actually a huge hole in the middle of this one. You've got a cold shut, as it's called down here, where the metal hasn't gone through properly. You've got wires poking through. You've got material coming off the cast and ruining the wires, holes. This one's got big holes at the back. And North Creek is just absolutely rubbish. So, yeah, they were kind of casting on, but they weren't doing high quality cast talk. Um, they weren't casting on high quality talks. And the ones that they were, it was all going wrong the whole time. As you can see here, we haven't actually found one cast talk apart from Newark, which has that addition of the hammered element that has actually worked properly. So why do you use sheet gold? Well, the, <laughs> the easiest way of putting it is it, it's more bang for your buck. Um, so on the left, we've got one of the Snettersham tubular talks. On the right, we've got the Snettersham great talk. They're both about the same size as you can see from the scale. One is 110 grams. The great talk is over 1,000 grams. So you get 10 of those for one of those. And they take it even further as well because the great talk really starts making use of air. So within these terminals, they are hollow. Within each of the ropes of the neck ring, they are hollow. And then all of those, they're like springs, as Rollaway says. All of those are wound around a hollow space. So it looks, I mean, the neck ring on the Great Talk is about an inch and a half thick. It looks like a really impressive thing. 
And if we compare it to the Ipswich talk, which has kind of half the neck ring diameter, half the size of terminals, but you compare the weights, they're the same. But the great talk, if you'd seen it at distance, would have looked as if it used a huge amount more gold than the Ipswich talk. So moving towards Scotland. Now, I'm not going to talk much about the finding of these talks because that's very much Fraser Hunter's work. But the beauty of these is they have actually been excavated around because Fraser and the National Museum of Scotland carried out this work. The talks themselves were found by a detectorist who then alerted the authorities. The authorities were able to come in and we've had so much valuable information about this because we now know what they were buried within. We don't often get that chance. We normally just have, because obviously with gold, you can't carbon date gold. You can't really do anything with it. It's just an artifact. But if you've got the site where it came from, you can actually start putting these artifacts back into their archaeological context and telling a far better story. But anyway, back to the talks themselves. So we've got these, well, it's actually four talks, but five pieces. There's two ribbon talks here at the back. And then this kind of lobed talk here on the left, which was actually in two pieces. And then this absolute madness of wire, which is the most wonderful thing I think I've ever seen at the front. So, yes, this is from when I was up in November having a look at them. So you can get some. You see, again, you see, you can see from the back. When do you ever see a talk from the back? I hadn't actually realised these were kind of a plate that all of this mad spaghetti junction is on. But I just want to show you some nice pics. Now this can just sit back for a couple of minutes and enjoy. This is a wonderful jeweler, silversmith called Brian Clark, who makes the most incredible things using original technologies and skills. Um, his website, www.ribbontalk.com is well worth going and seeing. He's recently just made a copy of the mould cape, the gold cape that they have at the British Museum that's come from Wales. Um, but I just wanted to show you this video. So sit back and enjoy. This is how ribbon talks are made. Is it going to? Is there any way you could turn up your sound test at all? No. Oh, sound. You're actually sharing sound on that <coughs> when you're playing the video. Just to say, there's no words on this. It's just music in the background, so.
So yes, ribbon talks. Most people think that they just come from a piece, flat piece of metal like that that you twist and they don't. If you're ever up in the National Museum of Scotland and you get the chance to see the Blair drum and talks, do have a look because there's actually a hole runs down the center of the spiral because of the way they're made. Absolutely stunning work. And that's what also differentiates them from the Bronze Age ribbon talks which actually are a twist. So that's a very quick and easy way of telling whether it's a Bronze Age or an Iron Age one. So the other talks in the Blair Drum and Horde, we also have these kind of weird, what's called lobed talks that you can see here. Now you can see at the end here, actually how they were made. These are a single sheet that has then been kind of concertinaed and wrapped round to create what we see here. This is incredible work. The fact that they have managed to punch out these kind of details to give it this 3D relief without going through the gold. And again, they're using a minimal amount of gold to make something much bigger, more three-dimensional. Gold really catches the light. This kind of thing in firelight would be wonderful. And if you look closely, we were laughing about this and we were looking at them. It's almost like little faces, this little eye and a mouth. Now, Celtic, in inverted commas, Latin Iron Age art is renowned for putting faces in things. Are these faces? I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if they weren't, though. If they were, though. And we've also got a lot of kind of similarities with other things further afield in Europe. Now, we don't get lobe talks further south in England or Wales, um, but we do get them in southwest France. So there's La Grasse here, Aurillac and Montchamp. They're made slightly differently. They're not the same style. The Montchamp one is actually cast. So we're not, we're not looking at the same thing. There's something different going on. And also Fraser's work has shown that the alloys in the Blair Drummond gold is very different to the continental versions. So these aren't imports. This is the thing that constantly happens in Iron Age talk studies. If it's something we haven't seen before, it goes down as an import. There is no reason to suggest that this was imported. And interestingly, when the Blair Drummond hoard was found, Mary Carhill, who is the, was the curator at the National Museum of Ireland, saw it and contacted Fraser and said, we've got one of those. And it had been sitting in the safe at the National Museum of Ireland, intriguing Mary for many, many years. Um, there's no context for it. It was, again, an antiquarian find. They knew it was from Ireland. They didn't know anything else about it. But as you can see, it's very, very similar to the Blair Drummond example, but it is different. The way that these little raised lobes are modelled is different. So this is not the same talk. This is two different talks, but very regionally similar between Ireland and Scotland. And again, that different silver percentage within the alloy. So to move on to, yeah, Spaghetti Junction. It's the maddest thing you've ever seen. It's all attached, it's all very firm. If you actually, I was lucky enough to very gently be able to pick it up. It doesn't behave like a kind of dangly thing. It, it, it has got a, um, a kind of rigidity to it. Not, it's not that rigid, but it, it's not a chain. Strange thing, never seen anything like it. There is nothing else like it in this country because you've got so many gold working techniques going on here. You've got attached filigree wire. You've got this plate at the back that's then surrounded by these plaited wires, which have been, they're almost like herringbone shape that have been soldered together. You've then got all these extra bits soldered on here. You've got granulation on the front of it. it it's really quite technically difficult to do this. And what's interesting is, as I say, there's nothing really like it anywhere else. But I found this looking through a book on Spanish gold that I got recently. 
And this is remarkably similar. This, again, is kind of twisted, added on wire, bits of granulation, not quite precise. I mean, different to this, again, but there's some, something going on there that's more relatable than anything else I've seen. So what does this all mean, my Laurel and Hardy moment? Now, the established view, again, like the established view of casting, this is a letter from John Lawton to Sir Walter Scott in 1806. One gentleman who saw them imagined them to be Roman. The most unaccountable part of this discovery is how so many articles, apparently of different ages and purposes, should have been found all together and in such a spot. So, yeah, didn't think, didn't think they should be in Scotland. Then by 1958... It's certain that none of the objects composing the Shore Hill Netherad Hoard originated in or anywhere near the district in which they were found. The coins are of non-British origin, but the British character of the other articles would suggest that the hoard came rather from an area of distribution in southeast Britain. Couldn't possibly be Scotland. This then continues. So Cyril Fox, in his Pattern and Purpose, a very influential book on Iron Age Celtic art. To this East Central School of Snettisham Talk A belongs the well-known gold talk terminal found at Kermure, Netherard, Peebles. It is here regarded as an expert to the north. You're getting the gist. And even as recently as 2018, we're still talking about everything being made in East Anglia, being transported out of East Anglia elsewhere. Now, there's no evidence for this. We have no workshops for gold working anywhere in Britain or Ireland. We've got a few crucibles with bits of gold in, but nothing major and nothing to say what they were actually making. So it hasn't really changed since Sir Walter Scott in 1806 to 2018. And a lot of the problem with this is a very famous site called Snettisham in East Anglia, which has at least... 250 to 300 talks represented. They're not all complete. There are a lot of them. I think it's about 80 that are complete. But it is the maddest site ever. 14 hordes, um, all different dates, all different types, silver, gold, bronze, gilded, bits of scrap stuff, complete talks, some nested, some. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely madness. It is completely not typical of the rest of Britain. And by now, Snettisham was actually first found when they ploughed up, um, what it's slightly, they ploughed up a few of the tubular talks in 1948 and then the Snettisham Great Talk in 1950. And then thanks to detecting, the British Museum went in and dug the site in the early 1990s. But since that date, there's been so many other talks that have come up. The Blair Drummond talks, 2009, Leek Frith, 2016. These two Towton talks were about 15 years ago as well. The Ipswich talks, 1960s. We've had various other finds, the Newark talk, 2005. Various other bits and pieces that are constantly changing the pattern. Unfortunately, this kind of dominance of Snettisham is still there and it it's not what the rest of talks in Britain looks like and it is something very very particular and weird and we also forget that not everything comes from East Anglia in fact things can go the other way as Fraser's pointed out we've actually got I mean the snail well bracelet is slightly not sure whether it might be Roman or not but that was found in Cambridgeshire and is related to the massive arm ring tradition of Northern Scotland. We've got in Norfolk, this is now actually in the British Museum, but it was found in Norfolk in inverted commas. One of these ribbon talks, more often associated with law, farm and places like that. So things can move from north to south. I know I don't need to tell you that, but unfortunately, within the literature, it's, it's so much a one way street. And when you look at where the British gold sources are, and when you look at where the sheep talks and the cast talk tradition is, this kind of rough line 
marks the boundary between the two. So you've got all these beautiful sheet and hammer talks, the Blair Drummond Horde, Netherard, the Breuter talks, that Irish Loeb talk, the Leek Frith, Newark, Clevedon, Essendon's kind of over that side of the line. But so are we looking at a sheet technology to the north and west making these stunning, very good gold talks, and then this cast technology to the south and east? that isn't doing so well, trying to copy what is almost impossible to do in cast, these wonderful sheet talks? Or are we looking at areas that are mainly dominated by coins or not coins? I don't think this is the case. I think, I think it is more likely that we have some sort of long running tradition going in the North and West that never quite gets into the South and East. So yeah, sheet versus cast. Sheet and hammered and very skilled casting. So the Newark talk in towards the north and west and poorer casting in the south and east where they don't really have that sheet work tradition and maybe copying things. And then we come to dating because the problem is, as I've said before, most of these talks have no contextual information whatsoever. So we are constantly relying on other things. There are a couple of dates, which I'll come to later from the Dating Celtic Art Project, which suggested dates of 370 to 160 BC for several of the talks that were repaired with lime bast at Snettersham. But generally, it's all been on art historical criteria. So this particular pattern occurs then and da 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 da. Anything unusual gets blamed on being imported. Most of the gold hasn't been looked at analytically in the way that they've looked at Blair Drummond, so we don't exactly know what the percentages of things are. We don't have a, a kind of national database of gold percentages we can compare to either. So currently what we've got is that Leek Frith and Caster, which of these are dated to around 400 to 250 BC because of the inclusion of these trumpet-headed talks, which occur on the continent so we are dating from the continent to over here and saying it must be this date. Grotesque talk is dated because it's in this plastic style, this very high 3D relief. The Snettersham Great Talk and Associated Bracelet, I'm still not entirely sure where the 150 BC date comes from. I suspect coins, but there isn't, there isn't anything to tie it down. And because of the Snettersham Great Talk, all of these other ones as being of the same style, also got dated to 100 to 50 BC. But there's no real reason for that. Now, the Blair Drummond talks and Iron Age ribbon talks, Fraser readily admits that we're not really sure, but he's given this kind of very broad 300 to 50 BC date range, which is brilliant because it doesn't actually say that we know. From our point of view, we are always looking from the craft perspective. So we've, I mean, we haven't ignored what's going on in the face of the art, but the technology to us is as important. And as I was saying earlier, both the Grotesque talk and the Snettersham Great talk look completely different in terms of art, but hiding under that art is exactly the same technology, this three-part making technique. So we've got two very different art styles showing the same torus and claw sheet technology. Influences. When you look further afield, who is influencing who? We don't really have the evidence that things are coming from Europe to here. It's equally possible they were going from here to there. And the thing is, we work with a lot of goldsmiths. Goldsmiths travel. They don't need an awful lot of equipment. You haven't got the big kind of furnaces and fires that you need with blacksmithing. You've got a very small toolkit, anvils that are perhaps only this big, small hammers. You could travel. All of the goldsmiths we've met, they all talk to each other. They all share ideas. I'm sure this has always been the case. There is no reason at all. I mean, when you read the classical accounts about Pythias, um, Tacitus's account, Dio's account, people are traveling constantly. They're whipping backwards and forwards between the continent and here. If they can, ideas can travel with them, goldsmiths can travel too.
because goldsmiths are likely to have been very skilled individuals who were working for a number of people. You wouldn't be a goldsmith in your village because you wouldn't you wouldn't get work. And even if you're working also in sheet bronze, it's a totally different technology to casting. So you wouldn't probably be casting axes or making, I don't know, plows or whatever else. And there is a com- a total possibility that they are cross-feeding ideas across the channel, up Scotland, down to England, across to Ireland, in this kind of mesh and trying to pull out who came first, I think is almost impossible. And this is why this narrative of South to North, Europe to Britain and Ireland, it, it stops us thinking about what might have been possible. And when you do actually start looking and pulling the technology together with the various other bits of evidence, we've actually been doing some work recently. This is the Snettersham bracelet. It's actually an arm ring, which was attached to the Great Talk when it was dug up. Now, these tubular talks above are also all from Snettersham, but they show a lot of design parallels. Here, there's actually a video if you want to see. Go to our website, The Big Book of Talks, and have a look on videos. And there's a paper that I gave about the Snettersham bracelet if you want to go into more detail. But the bottom line is there's a lot of influences here that come through in the bracelet and then we start seeing in talks. But all of these influences are 4th and 3rd century. They're not 100 BC. And this is the kind of biggest example which... A lot of you will have seen me spoken about before. This is the Clevedon Terminal, which again was found as much uh, part of a much bigger hoard, but which was then melted down. So it's a little buffer terminal with a flat end here. And on the side, it's got these shapes there, palmettes, pelters, which are deemed to be stage one around fourth century. There's stage one art if you're going for art historical criteria. Whereas on the face here, we have the Triskeel, which is far later, stage five. Now, people have been arguing over this for a long time, saying that this means that early art forms move through to the late period. However, if we look at it from a craft perspective, look at what's happening technologically. What we've actually suggested is that this terminal is a cut down version of a tourist talk, exactly like the Snettersham Great Talk or Netherad. So, You start off with your talk. It was cut down with this kind of flared lip, which is why you've then got this ruched bit here, because they've had to kind of squish it all in. Turned it upside down, put a lid on it at a later date. And when you compare it to Netherhead and the Great Talk, you can see it's higher at the front, lower at the back. Exactly the same dimensions are similar. So, in fact, technology can explain why we've got fourth century designs on the side because maybe originally this talk was fourth century and then it was cut down and remodeled later on. But again, not the kind of picture that we've seen before. So just to kind of sum up, and there's a lot of words here, but you can go back and look at the video later on. What we need to bear in mind is that goldsmiths can travel, objects can travel, ideas can travel, and they don't always travel one way in one direction or over centuries. It can be very quick. The goldsmiths that we've spoken to have said, if I see something, I'll then go and try it within a day or so because they're inspired by it, they're fired by it. They will make something up. So if you're dating according to art styles or distribution of objects via traveling north, traveling from Europe, these narratives really aren't reliable especially when we don't actually have any secure contextual dating or identified workshops. So we can say all these things, but we can't prove any of them. So what we're trying to do is kind of suggest, we're not saying that this is the case, but let's look at a few more narratives than the ones we've currently got. And when you do look at the Snettersham material, the fact that we've got this arm ring, which is quite an early style, Its decoration, the way it's made, et cetera, could very well bridge the gap between this kind of early, what's called the Valdalgeshein vegetal style and the later kind of Snettersham style of the Great Talk. 
And when you start comparing the motifs and design elements on Taurus Talks to those other early sheet items, they relate better to them than they do to the very late kind of mirror style, two dimensional, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're saying, and I've just written a paper about this, and I'm not sure how it's going to go down, is that we need to start actually recalibrating all of this and looking more at the Snetisham style maybe being another style that comes along at the same time as the plastic style, like the grotesque talk or the um, tours with and ones were sword style, plastic style, the tours helmet, another beautiful Scottish object, the horse chamfrain with the horns on the top. And that maybe all of these different styles of art are working at the same time or are kind of slotting in next to each other, slightly overlapping, feeding off each other. And what we can see from the technology underlying a lot of this is that we've got similar technology with different art styles on top. Now, maybe that could mean that the technology worked and they used it for hundreds and hundreds of years, but there's nothing to suggest that the Snetisham style isn't much earlier and that maybe isn't even from East Anglia. So as I've said before, if you track it against where you've got available gold, where you've got a history of sheet working, you start looking more towards the North and West beyond these kind of influences that are constantly buffeting against the channel. And this is kind of supported by the hammered sheet talks being concentrated in these areas. When we take Snetisham out of the picture, that mad kind of collection of deposition, everything else works in a far more sensible way. So in summary, don't accept art historical traveling north and one-way influence narratives. Um, and we need to start looking at multiple strands of evidence that include manufacturing technology and ideas exchange alongside art styles and forms. And then hopefully we might get a more nuanced picture. And finally, just to say, it would just be wonderful to get a talk, come up from an excavation where there's some pottery and goodness knows what, so we can date them properly like we can with other things. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, and I hope that's been of interest. Thank you very much, Tess. That was brilliant. Um, we, we've had we've had a few questions in, and, and Roland has very kindly been uh, helping answer them. But I'm sure other people would like to hear as well. So um, I actually really like Elizabeth Allen. You were asking something about. Do you want to ask your question, or shall I ask it for you? Yeah, I just wondered if these talks are flexible enough to be used a number of times. They give the impression of being fairly solid, but that may be a misconception. They, it is a complete misconception. Hey, 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 I'd like to talk. Now. Oh, I'll go on then. I'll let Roman <laughs> answer that one. He enjoys his springy talk. <laughs> um, no, they, they, it's just because they're sat in a box in a cabinet. That's the reason they look immobile. Um, and everybody's frightened of um, touching them. But um, and and there has been a good deal of mysticism applied to uh, the idea that somehow you know they would have aged a huge amount, and it's a reason why some of the uh, some of them are broken. But we were able to take the um, Newark uh, talk, which is virtually pristine, apart from one um, slice, uh, a small slice in the edge of it. And we took it to the uh, National Physics Labs where it was analysed for its literally its flexibility. Now, it was only flexed some centimetre or so um, between the jaws and then released and utilising a very, very uh, expensive camera. They were able to calculate where all the stresses were um, in the neck ring, which I've always called a spring or a, a conjunction of springs. Because if you were to coil up anything like that, you are indeed creating a spring. However lazy the, the coiling might be, it is indeed a spring. And it demonstrated that there was absolutely no stress in the back of it at all. In fact, when you open it, all the, the sides taking up the spring and not the back. 
So whenever they, they were severed in the back of the neck, that was done uh, deliberately, quite simply. Um, and the other aspect, the other aspect of um, of, of that uh, particular talk, the Newark one, is that when Glyn, the curator there at Newark, and he offers you to pick it up, and in your bare hands, he much prefers you in your bare hands, uh, simply because you can actually feel it rather than having cotton gloves on, it slipping in your fingers. He always says, "Don't bang the ends together." And when you pick it up, first thing you do is you bang the ends together. And when you look at the Great Talk and Newark. You can see that over the years, people have banged the ends together forever because they are that mobile. And it yeah, is, and you only have to look at them. You, you only have to look at them to see how small the gap is at the front and in what you might call the jaws of it. It has to open to slip around your neck unless you can take your head off. Um, and yes, they could have been sat on statues with removable heads, but you only get immobility as the uh, wires become thicker and thicker and, and turn into bars, and indeed like the iron ones um, and the tubular ones where they have to physically disconnect um, to be slipped, broiters are one of those uh, in a similar way. They have to disconnect in two parts to then sit around your neck or sections drop out like um, some of the French examples do, uh, bronze uh, examples. But the gold ones are, uh, which are made of cord wire, are quite simply so flexible. As to how comfortable they are, the first thing that strikes you is that they are cold as anything and heavy. But after a little while, it soon comes up to temperature around your neck. Um, mm -hmm. and I mean, just to say that yeah. that amount of gold, that's how much <clears> that just as props. That amount of gold alloy is what made the great talk, and that is a kilogram of gold. Yeah, wow, well, so indeed. <laughs> it's denser than lead. It's denser than almost everything. And you pick that up, and it's a kilogram. It's a real shock to the system how heavy it is. I mean, the one thing I will say, yeah. I'll actually put it in the chat as well. There is a talk called Trick Pingan which people need to go and look up because there's no way that one ever went on anyone's neck. It's three kilograms of solid silver and it's quite stunning. <laughs> right, the, another question we've got is um, from, well, it's just a, a statement from Linda Merrill. Do you want to, to, to say what you had to say, Linda? Thank, thank you, Elizabeth, by the way. Um, Linda? Um, well, I, all I was going to say was that there's um, some wonderful talks in the Catillon Horde in Jersey, which presumably can be dated from the coins as part of... Unfortunately, no? everything... To do, well, the problem is anything that's a deposit is the date it went in the ground. Yeah. So we know the date it went in the ground and the date of the coins when they went in the ground, but we don't know when the talks were made. Because if you look at Snettisham, yeah. utterly accepted by everyone, the grotesque plastic talk. Now, the Snettisham site, from what I can gather, Julia and Jodie are coming round to it being 60 BC. Now, that 60 BC is the date the deposits were made, but the grotesque talk is plastic style of art, which is certainly third century BC. Right. What sort of talks are the Jersey ones? I see. I read the Jersey ones are kind of tubular, thin tubular with a buffer at the end. And there's also a lovely um, Iron Age ring from there, which is really beautiful. It's, the, it's kind of single wire like that, but it's been wound into a kind of flower. It's beautiful. It looks, it looks very modern. If you found it, I think if a detectorist found it, they would have trouble a museum saying it was Iron Age if we didn't have ones previous to compare it to. But yes, I talked to Andrew Fitzpatrick a lot about Catillon. Um, stunning talks, yeah, and buried in that mass of coins. Bizarre. It's a stunning hoard altogether, yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. A friend of mine helped excavate it. She was taking out each coin, coin, but I mean, I don't know, it would have driven me nuts. Yeah, 70,000 of them, weren't there? 
Right, thank you. Thank you, Linda. And we had another one. It's it's by from Elizabeth, but it's Elizabeth's iPad. So Elizabeth, you know who you are. Do you, do you want to ask your question or do you want me to, to mention it now? Sure. Um, a couple things. Another question I have is how how thick was the sheet that they used um, for the gold? And yeah, so I was wondering if it's just like what we would call hollow form jewelry now, in which case I'm going to go downstairs and I'm going to make that torque. No, not really. But <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I'm, you just look at it and you think as a jeweler, oh, sure, that's cast. But um, really, it's no, amazing. It's, the Taurus torques, so these ones, are about 0.7 millimeters gold. Um, the tubular torques are actually 0.1 millimeters they are thin as anything but they are remarkable this is part of the reason why we bought this gold so we can play around with it and do all those things that you can't do with a gold wedding ring or anything else and 0.1 millimeter gold once it's work hardened is not that fragile as you'll know if you you're working with gold um it's an incredibly resilient material, actually. I mean, when it's annealed like this, this piece of 24 karat gold wire that's been annealed, and it does that, dead easy. But once I've done that a few times, just for everyone else, I realise you know this, Elizabeth, it gets harder and harder to do that. So you need to anneal it, which is, sorry, I should have said, which is heating it up to cherry red and then cooling it down again. And with gold like this, you don't need to pickle it. With other materials, you need to pickle it to get rid of the impurities. But as you can see now, it's getting increasingly hard. And I actually feel like I'm going to snap it in a minute. Um, but it is, it's an amazing material. I've never, yeah, Elizabeth's nodding. <laughs> it's like butter to work. I have no skill whatsoever. But I, I and I can't do anything elaborate, obviously. But I can play around with this and feel like it's letting me do things that other materials wouldn't. May I add that um, <laughs> when you've got gold, um, a high, you know, a high carat gold like that, and it's been annealed, um, it is and thin, you know, a millimeter and less, and you've just freshly annealed it. It's like working with something that's floppy. To get, it, 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 it can, it's very difficult to convey until you've actually got between your fingers to, to sense how it can be moved and so readily without um, any de um, defect in the metal occurring. Um, and that's another thing to talk about the hollow cast and um, the hollow form because we're actually, we've been working a lot with Ford Hallam. I don't know if you know Ford Hallam, who is a traditional Japanese master. Um, master goldsmith and there's a particular traditional Japanese technique where you actually have the gold kind of almost out as a balloon or you have it flat you fill it with pitch and then you work everything from the outside not repousse as we would do in the European tradition which is hammering everything from the back so you get these little dents on the inside and we can actually see on the inside of the nether terminal that that's what they've been doing because you get this very identifiable, almost like orange peel effect on the inside where everything's blurred. Whereas if you look at the back of something that's been done with repousse, because all the tooling is on that side, it's all very, very clean and sharp. So, yeah, we're identifying different. If you want to know more, there's loads on the Big Book of Talks. It's all free. It's all open access. Um, and there's various videos and other talks that we've done talking about all these different things. But, yeah, they are incredibly skilled. They're using so many different techniques. It's amazing. We've got lots of um, thank yous as well from Moira, Caroline, David, Bridget, all saying how much they enjoyed the talk. And Sheila was saying that she'll always look at the National Museum ones a, a bit a bit different now as well. And there's a, yeah, there's you can a, go to the National Museum and there's Netherrode on one side in one case and the Blair Drummond talks and also a lot of the Le Law Farm ribbon talks as well. And you'll never look at them the same again. <laughs> um, yeah. 
And there's a question from Caroline Nicolay as well. Um, do you want to ask it, Caroline? Or do you want me to ask it for you? Caroline says, oh, yes, sorry. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. Thank I you. just found the, the right button. Thank you. Uh, yes, I never heard of um, of talks made of iron. I, I didn't realize that existed at all. Um, yeah. Maybe because it's less less shiny, so we see them less. Um, I don't know if there's many, if they are in a specific area, or if it's mainly terminal, cast terminal that we found for these, anything like that. The, there's a couple from Spettersbury. Hillfort speaks, but I assume it's Spettersbury in Dorset, um, and they are wrought iron, so they look like the kind of standard ring terminal with the twist. Yeah, they're really strange. There's none, there's nothing in iron from Snettisham. Nothing I know of, there might be a couple towards the Roman once they start becoming, because you start getting all these new talks once the Romans start the beaded talks and various other things. But Spettisbury, yes, definitely. Um, it's the most bizarre thing. If anyone's interested in seeing it, I can send them an image afterwards. <laughs> but yeah, they were unusual. There's also a lead one from Northampton, which is bizarre. It's kind of very, very plain. Um, but again, very unusual. The, you know, these are one-offs or one or two of them. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. And there is a question from Margaret B., um, Margaret, do you want to ask it yourself? Yes, I will. In fact, I think it, the answer was touched on by Roland, uh, Roland just as I was finishing typing it in. But the point I was going to make was in response to uh, how you were showing the bending uh, of, the, of the material and how it might behave, that would surely be um, influenced uh, very heavily by the chemical composition. Um, both the original ductility and its performance after plastic deformation would surely be um, heavily reliant on that. I think Roland's comment confirmed that. But then it struck me another thing. Is it possible from the chemical composition to establish or, or, or narrow down to some extent where the geographic location the gold came from originally? Ask me, ask me, ask me. At this oh. moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a big bugbear with Mr. Williamson. It really, is. it really is, because um, that would tell us an awful lot, wouldn't it? Um, if we could um, add a location to where the bulk of the gold has come from. And obviously, gold isn't just, I say obviously, the truth is gold is never just pure gold. It, in amongst it, it has palladium and um, platinum, I believe, and along with the copper. Um, uh, and occasionally a bit of silver mixed in with it. And I would have thought that the ratios of the original sites of, of gold mining um, could be used as a background um, map. Um, and I'm sure all the gold production companies uh, know exactly what this is like, just like the oil companies know an awful lot about the geology of the, of the planet, but don't bother sharing it because it's not in their interest to share it. Um, I think they but, would. Um, well, yeah. uh, I think... exactly. But these, what I'm saying is that those trace elements would give you a fingerprint, which I think you could pick up in other gold items. Now, the argument has always been made that gold, there's only X amount of gold. And over the um, millennia, it's been either blended, cut um, with other gold sources, and it would make it far too difficult to work out what's what. But I, I firmly believe that fingerprint will still be there just as much as our DNA, our own Pearson DNA, has those elements still in there where we can begin to pick apart the origins. But it, it would be such a massive project to try and uh, start something like that anyway. Yeah, I think... I think the problem is they've, they've done some amazing work. Chris Standish has done some brilliant work on Bronze Age gold because most of it um, back then doesn't seem to be so recycled. It was more, it was closer to the source of the original gold. Um, the problem you've got with Iron Age 
I mean, like that Clevedon talk, you know, that's been cut down, remodeled. The new the Netherad talk has been taken off its terminal, off its neck ring. The great talk, we're working on something at the moment because it looks as if both terminals are actually different and they weren't originally attached to that neck ring. It looks like in the Iron Age they are recycling, reusing, playing with, mixing alloys. I mean, you've got gold alloys going from 10% gold up to 90% gold in something like that session bracelet with varying proportions of silver, bronze, all kinds of uh, silver and copper, all kinds of other things. I think it would be very difficult to say this came from here. But what I imagine is we might get general regional patterns where we would be finding that generally they were recycling within an area. So you might get some kind of signature for that area. But I don't think we're ever going to be able to get as specific as bronze. I mean, the big problem is you can't, if you're going to do something like this, you need to do every single, what they did with the Bronze Age stuff is that they took the machines and went and did it on every single different thing they could find. With the Iron Age, trying to take, these things are so stupidly valuable trying to move them even. We've been really lucky because Newark Museum, the National Civil War Centre at Newark, has allowed us to do a lot of the work on the talk and they've been quite happy to move it around. But for the National Museums, that's very difficult. They have to jump through a lot of hoops. So you've got to take the kit to them. That kit has to be absolutely high end if you're going to manage to get any results at all. Because if anyone tells you about PXRF, Ignore them, you know, the handguns that they all talk about. Yes, you will get a general percentage of what it's used for um, with detected finds is saying whether it's of a certain percentage of gold roughly. But you can't do anything majorly analytical with XRF. It's just not accurate enough. So, yeah, love to do it. Unfortunately, we are independent researchers. So getting hold of a huge amount of grant money like that. And also, I'm not sure I'd want to take on a project like that. It's a project for a big team in a national uni um, university or museum. Maybe. There's lots more people saying thank you very much as well from James and M. And um, yeah, I'd just like to say to James, that was very cheeky about modern. <laughs> just because he's, he's a rock basher doesn't mean that the rest of us have to be. <laughs> Do you want to reply to that, James? It's run away. He's run away. <laughs> and also from Sharon, who's the head of our museum as well, how much she enjoyed it um, as well. And just shows that you can learn so much from re replica work. You, I mean, it is, it's amazing. Um, Moira mentioned that the iron would have rusted away, and Roland's replied that yes, you would imagine that, but they are there and there was one yeah they're very corroded but they are very noticeably yeah, yeah. They're, they're very very noticeably at all and then a thank you from Richard and then they're doing some oh from Linda Merrill do you want to ask your question Linda about the silver well it wasn't actually a question but I, I think the the Galloway the Viking horde the Galloway horde I think they're analyzing the silver from that um, and that's been, you know, mixed up and re remelted because that's what the Vikings did. And they still seem to be able to identify sort of the main sources of it, apparently, or at least that's what they're hoping to do. So you probably could do it with the gold, but if somebody would let you. Yeah, I mean, the other problem that you've got is something like the, the Stettisham Great Talk is actually 70 pieces of gold. So you can't just... Um, kind of take measurements from one piece of the gold and assume it's going to be the same as all the rest of it. Because, um, I mean, even just the nether earth terminal there on the screen, that's at least three pieces of gold. So you'd have to have three measurements on that, 70 measurements on the great talk. <laughs> I didn't say it was it possible. <laughs> it is possible. I would love to see it done. I mean, it would be possible to try. And I think until we've tried, we don't know. Um, but it won't be straightforward in the way that it might have been for the Bronze Age. 
I love your reply, Roland. Throw money at me and we'll test the theory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If anyone's got forty thousand pounds in gold, just yeah, we'll make one. <laughs> And we've got so uh, Margaret B. It would not work with recycled only possible where virgin ore was used. Um, and yeah, sorry. What what I meant there was uh, when we were talking about chemical composition. If it's if it, if they've used the virgin ore, then chemical composition of the virgin ore that would be easy. But if you've yeah. mixed it from other sources, then uh, forget it because okay, you might have. Uh, trace elements that are only from one source, but you don't know it hasn't been mixed with something else at the time. So virgin ore would be where to start. Yeah. And also, I mean, as I was saying in the talk, we don't know where these talks came from. They're travelling all over the place. The fact that we've got three talks by the same hand across 300 miles, how would we actually say which one of those is in place and which ones have travelled, or are all three of them coming from somewhere completely different? Oh, he's going <laughs> to. I'm going to say something here. Um, to learn how to utilise gold, obviously, you need to have the gold. That's kind of logic, is it not? And so, if you've got it on your back, on your uh, doorstep, um, the likelihood is that you're as a community you're going to be utilizing that material um and learning how to use that material um and i fully expect that in future we will understand that indeed the makers learnt their trade from the materials on their you know i say yeah. on their back doorstep and only later on was it then that that they experienced they exported to other sources and things like that and it goes hand in hand with the <laughs> Mick Lagarde. <laughs> um, it goes hand in hand with um, uh, learning, you know, how far the uh, materials were traveling in themselves. Um, it is quite effective, but, you know, it, it's one of those things that somebody's got to be, take a brave, brave jump and a leap into examining these things. Um, just like it was for the origins of, you know, testing strontium in people's teeth and oxygen isotopes and what have you. Oh, there's a good question. Next one. Thank, thank you, Margaret. Um, for Moira, or you had a question or you, you say to something as well? Uh, not really a question, uh, more of a comment uh, that uh, no matter how much valuable data you got from analysing the, the gold uh, trace elements, uh, it still wouldn't tell you where the, the goldsmith came from. Or how far he travelled. Yeah. Or she. Or she. Yep. Oh, completely. I I yeah, there's actually goldsmiths working in London, medieval goldsmiths, um, women who've got their own um marks, makers' marks. And there's a wonderful illustration um by oh, his name has absolutely escaped me. Tom Bjorkman, Bjorkland who's got this wonderful, he does these wonderful paintings of people in the past, and there's a wonderful one of a, I say female bronze smith, but a bronze smith who happens to be female, with two children as well working around. And yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure, because these, these skills needed to be taught and learnt probably within kind of family groups, probably along some kind of apprenticeship system from the way of, you know, you start young, you learn, you then go off on your own maybe. And if you're doing that, I can't imagine that they were sitting there saying, no, you're a girl, you can't. Um, yeah, I like to think there were women doing this as well. And then moving further down, James and um, James said, I fled after commenting. <laughs> yeah, so he should. <laughs> and then Elsa saying thank you very much as well, how much she enjoyed it. And Anne as well, thank you. And Julie. Mick Lagarde. Oh, what's They're going all Viking on us. <laughs> ah. And there is a comment from Roland. Oh, for you, Roland. 
<laughs> I'm reading yours there. It becomes clear <laughs> that Arab silver was being converted to Viking bullion. So you answered. Thank you. And final, I think we'll come up to the final couple of questions. One from Caroline Nicolay. You want to ask it, Caroline? Yes, yeah, sorry, me again. Um, I have a million questions, but I'll, I'll just do that. So what's your personal favorite discovery, the, the things that you yeah, found out just working and replicating talks? And then what would be your project of choice if you were given a huge million pound grant? Shall I go first? Yeah, you go first. <laughs> Favourite personal discovery. It's got to be Newark and Netherard. Netherard from the point of view of sitting that day in the National Museum going, oh my goodness, look at this. And me and Roland Fraser getting very excited about what we could see on the inside of this talk and what it was going to mean. Um, also discovering that the Snettersham Great Talk was made of sheet and trying to persuade the British Museum of that. Um, and my project of choice, now I know this sounds a bit mad, but if I was given a huge grant, what I would love to do more than anything else is get all of the really good goldsmiths that we work with and get all of these talks in the same room on a table with everyone around and so we could just look at them all together, compare and contrast, talk about them, listen to the goldsmiths. That would actually tell us what the antiquarians used to do, you know, meeting for supper with their latest find. But in a bit more of an academic way, that would tell us so much, more than any machine that goes ping or whatever else. It would, it would be stunning. That was what I would spend my millions on. Mm. Um, I think def definitely the, is the, the best one was um, peering into the interior of um, Netherred, that, that, which you can just see there now, because uh, we I arrived with a very specific conceit of um, how it was made, because that was my personal solution to the problem. And uh, just being blown away, it literally took a millisecond to realise that what we were looking at, I say we, it was me initially, because I was brave to pick it up out of the bread basket that it arrived in. Um, it's all got, for, see the black foam in the background, it's surrounded with that, of course, with pins in it. But pick it up, look inside, and literally in a flash, it was obvious that it was just hammer marks, or arguably the, the ghost uh, images of hammer marks because they'd all occurred from the exterior and it was the shape that was left on the interior that fine that puckering um and it was kind of just mind-blowing quite simply that because it it suddenly through the, the the research into the these objects in a completely different direction um, yeah, and I wouldn't mind a good symposium, but I'm not sure there was decent uh, volumes of wine there as well, I have to say. Um, or or Boudicca and, beer. Yeah. Talk, there is a golden talk beer made by our friends in Boudicca breweries in Norwich. That's I'd go with gin. Them. I'd go with gin and tonics. Yeah. <laughs> um, and as for, you know, a, there's, there's quite a conceit. Um, no, it isn't. It's an ego trip about making replicas you you feel you're you've kind of tracked down um <laughs> um <laughs> i'm just seeing the message thank you uh, uh, there's there's a bit of an ego trip because you feel that you've begun to genuinely tread in, in the same um footprints of the original maker how true that is is always uh, open to argument but you know you feel that you track them down what their individual moves were and your solutions must be pretty close to the solutions they came up with for creating a single um, item. And it scares the bejesus out of me to imagine doing such a thing, to be honest. Um, yeah, I am i don't know, but yeah. Gin and tonic and a lot of chit chat with them in front of us. And I've always said we should stop, stop venerating them and we should investigate them 
And I know that means touching them. Every gold worker that I know wants to grasp them and literally turn them over and flex them and do everything. The, the, the great talk, I, there's one of the terminals looks like if you give it a little twist, you better pull it off. It looks so poorly connected. And that yeah. would tell you far more than just sitting there going, ooh, don't touch it. No, you are not allowed to take mm. the end of the great talk. We've talked about that. <laughs> Well, look, thank you both very much. We've had lots of messages saying thank you. And we've had some good jokes in there as well. So um, it's been fantastic having you both here to talk about it. It's so interesting. So thank you so much. And I put a, a link on in your um, in the, the chat as well, but you've also got the your uh, website there, which um, looks looks really fascinating as well. So thank you, Tess, and thank you, Roland. and. Thank you, everybody else from around the world who has contributed this evening. It's been fantastic. It's been lovely to have you all here. Um, our next talk that we've got is Dr. David Caldwell, who's a retired creator from the National Museum of Scotland. And that's on the 20th of April. Um, and he's actually going to repeat a talk that he did um, last year that we didn't manage to record. And we've had so many requests to hear it. He's very kindly offered to do the talk again for us as we had some technical difficulties on the evening. So that's about the medieval burial monuments and sculpture of Camarton. And it's on our website now if you'd like to book onto it. You'll have to resubscribe. And then our new series of talks is starting in June. And I'll watch this space, basically. I'll be uh, letting you know about that. It'll be in our education newsletter, which you can subscribe to. And when I've finalised all the details, it'll be on the website as well. But thank you again, Tess and Roland. That was brilliant. And I think it's just good night, everybody. That was fantastic. And give me lots to think about. Thank you. <laughs> and do get in touch if you want to know any more. <laughs>